Hello, everyone. Can you hear me, Aaron? Yep. Coming through loud and clear. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Takahashi, and thank you for joining our leadership series, where I host guests to discuss topics of interest in the life science services, tools, and molecular diagnostic domains. Today, I'd like to welcome Aaron Fisher. Currently, he's vice president at Broad Oak Capital Partners, where he originates, executes, and manages Broad Oak's growth capital investments. Currently, he serves as a board director at Flagship Biosciences, Sanguine Biosciences, CDI Labs, and as a board observer at Horizon Infusions. He was formerly in private equity, equity with Northwood Healthcare Partners and HIG Growth Partners. Aaron, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So if you don't mind, if we could just start by you sharing, why did you choose Broad Oak and what's your role there? Yeah, happy to. So I, uh, I joined Broad Oak uh, four years and some change ago. Uh, at the time, we were uh, on the investment team, at least a uh, team of three, actually. Um, and, you know, since that time, we have grown quite a bit. But I think what I was initially uh, attracted to was um, the returns profile of the strategy and approach we were taking um, was, uh, was certainly uh, staggering it was uh definitely top quartile performance and and continues to be so but on top of that i think it was uh just a unique approach i mean the two things about us that i would highlight is you know the rigorous focus on life science research tools and pharma services and then um the second uh core aspect of us is i would say unparalleled flexibility and check size and structure we'll do ever we'll look at everything from minority growth equity to buyout, change of control to, you know, more structured uh, MES investments as well. Great. And, and then regarding your, your question on my responsibilities, I think, um, you know, we're still a relatively small team. We've been growing um, pretty aggressively and, and we'll continue to do so. But uh, as of now, I'd, I'd say my responsibilities range for everything from, you know, sourcing new opportunities to structuring and executing our investments. And, and then, of course, uh, managing the portfolio as well. Okay, super. Thank you. So just to give a little context, today's webinar content has been based on our audience's input and questions they'd like answered and the topics they'd like discussed. So if uh, the audience has additional questions, feel free to use the chat feature and we'll do our best to address your request at the end of the presentation. So I'll just start by asking Aaron, um, how have you identified portfolio companies and what's the most significant criteria about a company that piques your interest? And if there are any examples you can share, that would be helpful. Yeah. So your, your first question, I mean, what, um, how do we identify portfolio companies? I think, um, for us, our approach is we have, I'd say a dual pronged approach to sourcing. It's, uh, thematically focused uh, is kind of one area that we approach. And then uh, the other way is through opportunist, opportunistic, um, just opportunities that quite frankly, kind of land on our desk from um, a mix of areas, I'd say. Uh, one, another unique thing about Broad Oak that I, I forgot to highlight is there's a number of former, uh, you know, successful executives from the industry who uh, invest with us in our funds and um, they often um, are great sources of, of investment opportunities and also, you know, help to serve on, on boards and help coach our companies. Um, we also have an advisory business. Um, so investment opportunities, a fair amount of times get kicked over to our side of the house. Um, I think uh, a follow up question you had was um, what do we kind of focus on or, you know, what is kind of the hurdle for us? I know the, the title of the webinar um, was titled Startups our life science startup. So, I mean, certainly I think maybe it's helpful to provide some perspective on where we focus. Um, the average revenue size of the company in our portfolio is about 20 million. Um, and I, you know, for us, we'll invest in everything that, uh, you know, as, as little as kind of first kind of commercial proof of sale uh, mm -hmm. up to, you know, companies that are, that are larger, um, way larger. Uh, but, you know, I think for us, we still kind of think of ourselves focusing on companies that are uh, 
kind of hitting a commercial uh, growth inflection point. That's certainly been the core of what we do, but we've also raised a, uh, what I'd call a smaller kind of venture fund that's for, uh, um, for companies that have proven or shown that they have demonstrated commercial proof of concept with their products or services. Um, but needless to say, I think, you know, for us, the, the focus mostly has been on commercial traction and growth. Um, I think what's important to note, I mean, once you get past the technical stage of de developing a product, I mean, the, the investment risk just goes down, you know, quite a bit. Um, so commercial traction is certainly something we've focused on. Um, your customer roster really matters a lot. Um, it, you know, I, it looks like we made a note here, nothing signals more positive information regarding a company than what their customers say. I'd also say that, you know, customers you've lost to tell you a lot uh, in diligence. So, um, so yeah, I, I forget, was there any follow up you had on that, Matt? Yeah. So in addition to commercial traction, you know, what stands out with the companies that have partnered with Broad Oak? Yeah. So, you know, I think for us, and I think, you know, as to the entrepreneurs out there um, in the audience right now, I think it's certainly in your, in my opinion, best interest uh, to be disciplined in, in capital efficiency. And what I mean by that, and the way, I, you know, we think about measuring that a lot is kind of what is the level of commercial traction you have relative to the amount of capital you've raised uh, to get to that point. And um, I, you know, I'm sure we'll spend some time talking to her about, about the market that we're in right now. But, you know, if you were to rewind, call it two to three years ago, where, you know, money was flowing, um, companies were getting funded that um, really didn't have much to show. I think the name of the game was, you know, conquer the world, um, raise massive rounds and, and go after every opportunity you could go in a market. Um, I think for us, we we kind of stay true to our roots, which is, you know, we like to back founders and companies that that are very disciplined with how they invest in their business. Because at the end of the day, we're giving you our money and our investors money to manage uh, is, is a good way to think about it. So uh, the other things that stand out is, you know, when you come in and share the ideas or what you want to go after. I mean, you know, we like our capital going into into opportunities that are going to have a you know, defined ROI and, um, you know, it can be kind of provable uh, growth avenues. Um, the other thing I'd say is if you are an unprofitable business, um, having a manageable burn rate, I think is, is certainly prudent. It's certainly important for us, but uh, certainly prudent, uh, I think, in today's market. And then, um, you know, proven product market fit, we can probably talk a little bit later about, um, you know, what specifically I mean by that, but um, that's usually well demonstrated once a company's shown sufficient commercial traction. But um, before that, there's ways to kind of think about uh, measuring if you're achieving that. Um, and then certainly I think it's important to mention that having a well-defined competitive position for your product or service and marketplace is kind of a generic statement, but, um, you know, I think you should really be able to understand as an entrepreneur what um, what areas your your products or services kind of stack up relative to competitors, and and what customers care about, and why you are uh, maybe better positioned than others. Okay, great. We'll be getting in a few more details about some of those items you just mentioned as well in a in a few minutes. Um, so. Why do most companies not make it as a broad oak portfolio company? And in general, what's lacking in those companies? Yeah, I think, look, there's, um, you know, a lot of different ways that we, we look at a business. But I mean, it, you know, I think certain things certainly stand out. Um, it, you know, if a business is, is flat from a commercial standpoint, right, you certainly want to understand why that's happening. I mean, there's a no, number of reasons that... Uh, you could have stagnant revenue performance, could be leadership, it could be, you know, lack of commercial uh, infrastructure resources of the business, it could be a problem with the product. But, um, you know, I, I would say, again, you know, as you're out raising capital, it's you're always trying to find reasons uh, 
to avoid getting people to pass just because, you know, quite frankly, there's a, you know, as much as you have gone on as an entrepreneur, we've got, you know, a lot of opportunities we're looking at things that we're doing as well. So um, unhealthy burn rate. I mean, look, it, it really depends when you're talking to someone like Broad Oak, we, again, as I mentioned, we emphasize capital efficiency and, um, you know, I think if you're talking about some of the big venture investors in the world, an unhealthy burn rate or a large burn rate isn't as much of a concern to them as it is us. Um, so again, I'm you know just caveating here that I'm only giving you uh, my perspective on it. But you know, I I personally where I spend most of my time is probably more in pharma services, service based businesses that actually tend to um, more efficiently achieve profitability than maybe some of the instrumentation. Uh, companies to our portfolio. So for me, I'm, I'm, I get pretty uncomfortable with any kind of significant burn rate, but, um, you know, across the portfolio, I'd say we, you know, we try and shy away from anything that's burning more than $5 million a year. Um, unattractive customer purchasing trends. You know, I think the goal at the end of the day, as I mentioned, to kind of achieving capital efficiency and making sure that you're generating a nice return on on investment is is does a company have products or services where they have customers that are coming back to the well and repurchasing and not only repurchasing um you know the same amount but repurchasing more um i think that's that's generally shows a, a level of stickiness and, and interest in in what the business is doing um but you know i think if you have a customer base that's maybe buying a unit, whether it's an instrument or, you know, they're buying a service for uh, maybe a one-off biomarker discovery application and, um, you know, not ever coming back to the well. I think that's for us something to dig into or maybe a red flag. Um, and then look, at, at the end of the day, I think great businesses are really built on the backs of incredible leadership teams. And, um, you know, that's, I think, a lot of times there's there's signals you can glean uh, in interacting with enough management teams is, as I have over time where uh, there are folks that, you know, just initial behaviors might be red flags to uh, to not being really receptive to taking advice or or being, you know, productive partners in the future. So that's, you know, for me, a, a pretty immediate kill in my book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And um, what are you uh, see as the most significant blind spots that startups or growth stage companies may not see? Yeah, so again, it, it looks like I put the caveat here. Uh, depends on the stage of company. But um, look, I think it's, it's really I, I empathize a, a lot with the entrepreneur. I think it's I'm always incredibly impressed with um, the amount, uh, a lot of the folks that we've invested in or, or invest in or consider investing in have accomplished on, on so little. And, you know, I think being heads down in your area and being an expert in what you're focused in, uh, in these markets that are, you know, extremely technical by nature, um, can, can make it easy to have blind spots. So I don't mean this, you know, disrespectfully, but things that we see a lot is, um, again, highlighting the nature of, of kind of the technical aspects of our markets, you tend to find a lot of very scientific uh, technical founders who um, are developing very interesting products based on very fascinating science. But what I'd really encourage people to think about is it is worth investing early on uh, doing conducting some market or research or, or, or investing early in some commercial resources that that help drive your product development in a way that is responding to market needs and not just based on, you know, maybe something you had experienced doing in a lab that you thought was interesting. Because um, mm -hmm. cool science doesn't always translate to to revenue, and you're in a you're in a business, not not a, a science project. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, I would also say that you know I think you tend to, to get entrepreneurs that are very excited um, about, about what they're developing. And, you know, I think there's a tendency, you know, one of the benefits you have by having kind of an institutional investors 
we're often looking at your competitors or um, have done a deep dive into competitive uh, companies. And so I think, you know, can show relatively naive to, to come and, and just tout that your product is absolutely better than everyone else's, but not be able to kind of substantiate why. Um, so I think it's really important that you're keeping an eye uh, on competition and, and understanding what things at the end of the day that the customer cares about for whatever application you're going after and making sure that you're comparing uh, thoughtfully to, to kind of other competitors that are developing. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, I mean, trends in the market overall, I, I, you know, I'm sure we'll probably talk a lot today about the current market we're in, but, um, you know, there are certain times to think uh, strategically about when to raise capital, how to raise it, uh, you know, why to raise it. And, um, you know, it's uh, sometimes people get caught with their pants down, um, you know, maybe raising money at a price they shouldn't have or, or um, just kind of understanding, um, you know, the, the more macro environment that they're in uh, relative to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So next, you know, what makes a company's solution sound too good to be true versus maybe something that seems like a worthwhile area for a longer term development? You know, sometimes the technology moves so fast and some solutions are obsolete before the platform is completed. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I guess uh, the, the first question on, um, you know, uh, the best technologies or products, I, I, again, it looks like I highlight here, solve practical problems for customers. I think, um, again, let's rewind to call it a couple of years ago where money was flowing. Um, and I, I think a lot of people who were able to present, um, were able to present ideas that, you know, were, were very large and a kind of take over the world mentality was something that was sought after for probably a lot of the Silicon Valley uh, types. But, um, you know, I think that's not always, in my opinion, the best best way to kind of approach building a business. I think, you know, it's obviously there are books written about, you know, some of the big venture bets that have paid off, um, you know, some companies that we all use today that are changing the world. And um, I think in my experience, I've tended to see that the majority of most companies do not end up like the next Facebooks or Googles. Uh, they tend to overcapitalize for efforts that um, that they should have undercapitalized for, and as a result, end up you know in the red or going out of business. But um, again, in my my opinion, and in, in kind of the best technologies or products, I, I would encourage folks to just be able to to really. Uh, focus on being able to define the value your product or service creates for a particular customer and a particular application. You know, what, if it saves your customer time, be able to, to demonstrate and quantify how much, um, you know, if it helps you, a customer or researcher consolidate complicated workflows, be able to, to speak in detail what those workflows are and if they were even a pain or a headache in the first place. But I think approaching a building a business um like you're building a product that solves a problem um and being very kind of methodical and practical about knocking down problems one at a time is is a pretty good recipe for success at least in early days um again it looks like noting here the best products and services need to be no-brainer purchases for your customer i you know i think investors are become pretty keen on picking up on that? Is this something that demonstrates immediate value in, in markets that we understand? And, um, you know, I think that's usually demonstrated through pretty uh, solid commercial traction as well. And then again, you know, go, the last point on this slide, often the best answer is an incremental improvement to a technology that solves a big problem for the customer. I think this is, uh, for me, an area that I like, you know, if, if you're looking at innovating in a market that's already proven, um, you know, I'll give you an example, uh, flow cytometry, for example, a Salix is a business that we invested in that, um, has a, I call it a, a very easy to use flow cytometer used for cell therapy in the manufacturing floor. It, it just took the complexities out of flow cytometry for the repeated use, uh, streamlined use of manufacturing for cell therapies. And 
uh, to us, I mean, you could quantify the amount of time it saves someone on the manufacturing floor, the ease of use of it. Um, it was just kind of an obvious uh, product for the, the desired application. Um, so again, the, you know, the focus should be on proving or developing a technology that maybe solves a defined problem for a customer in a certain application. Okay. Great, thank you. So getting to those uh, end goals, I think the next question is kind of geared towards, you know, how do you prioritize areas such as setting objectives and key results and aligning in incentives to motivate people for strategic growth, M&A, partnership opportunities, and exit planning? Yeah, look, I think this is, uh, this is really an important slide and, and framework to discuss again, you know, is, uh, maybe a lot, a lot of folks on the line here are, are entrepreneurs or maybe kind of more uh, technical uh, in their nature or background. But, it, you know, when you're thinking about building a business, you got to have a team that's swimming together uh, towards a set group of objectives um, and they understand the results um to achieve, they understand the results or outcomes from those objectives, but also they have a plan on how to actually achieve uh, those objectives. So I, I really think there's, you know, there's, it's absolutely critical that there's a fair amount of, of goal setting and, and strategy um, that you think through uh, as a team and set for the year. Uh, this isn't, you know, we don't have all of our companies do this. And, you know, a lot of it depends on what kind of position we have in the business, whether you know it's an influential equity uh, position or not, on on whether or not we can implement this. But I'd say for almost you know all the companies I'm involved with, we are very rigorous about implementing OKRs um, at the beginning of the year and um, making sure we have a defined set of goals that kind of rolls out throughout the entire organization. Um, that's for everyone down to the bench scientists to the janitor to, um, you know, every, every member of the team. Uh, the other kind of key point, and I mean, I guess if, if you don't take anything away from today, I would say the, the most important thing I've seen in my career is that incentives matter. Uh, people on your team are going to do what they are incentivized to do. And um, you should align incentives to achieve the certain objectives and goals that you're setting for the organization. Um, it, it sounds obvious, but uh, I mean, you wouldn't believe the amount of folks that, you know, we work with that um, maybe don't prioritize this. Um, we have a bullet here. It's important to know your team and what matters to each of them. I think, uh, you know, that can give you wiggle room and maybe financial, you know, gains aren't, aren't the key incentive that matters to each employee of yours, but you should absolutely understand what, what does motivate, motivate them and why and, and, kind of align their incentives to uh, the goals of the team, the organization. Um, looks like I made a note here, compensation, in my opinion, should be tied to delivery of OKRs or or achieving budget, uh, individual team and organizational goals, because, um, you know, at the end of the day, people are going to vote with their wallets. Um, from an M&A partnership standpoint, look, M&A, you know, there's a lot of studies out there that M&A can destroy value. I, you know, it certainly can if you're not thoughtful about it, but can also create a ton of value. I, uh, I'm actually a big proponent of having companies, particularly in my portfolio, explore partnerships early on. It can be a good way to to see whether or not you know an acquisition makes sense down the road. And um, you know, some things to think about as you're you're contemplating M and A is, you know, a lot of times it's going to take, you know, whether it's a mix of cash or equity, but you really want to make sure you have defined a, a plan for um, for realizing whatever um, whatever synergies or, or opportunities you think you know the two combined entities can act on. But separately, whether or not you have the capabilities and resources to actually successfully integrate an add-on, uh, one of the things that we see a lot of times with earlier stage companies trying to execute M and A is you know the companies seem to fit beautifully together, but they actually don't have a team. Uh, that's experienced enough to really integrate cultures and 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 realize the value out of what they've done. So that's something to think about. Um, and then exit planning. Look, I, I think at the end of the day, you um, if you're raising 
outside capital, um, you know, the first thing that those individuals are going to care about is, you know, how, how are you going to take my dollar and turn it into two or three or four? Um, and there has to be an exit at some point. Um, so having an idea of your exit strategy uh, and keeping track of, you know, the landscape and M&A, what, what uh, strategics care about buying and why uh, really can help you guide the rest of uh, the ways you build your business, right? Maybe you decide to ditch a certain product, um, product portfolio R&D project because, you know, you just don't see the M&A landscape forming around um, that opportunity anymore. So uh, I think exit planning, you know, should be done at, you know, probably once a year, um, just getting an idea of the M&A landscape and, and being really thoughtful about uh, how the market's shaping up. Great. Okay. So, yeah, on the topic of raising capital, kind of leads us into this next slide. Uh, what are your thoughts on complementing fundraising with non-dilutive funding options such as grants? And how do you recommend raising capital in an investor-friendly market, not necessarily a, a founder-friendly market? Yeah, so I mean, we we are certainly in an investor-friendly market right now. I, I think even you know, for as an investor, you know, at, at Broad Oak, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because we have companies in the portfolio that, you know, we were on track for a great exit, uh, call it probably a year ago, if we were in the, the same market environment. But now it's probably not a good time to sell. Uh, vice versa, it's a great time to uh, be investing, and you know. Um, it's certainly, you know, if you're investing equity, you're looking as an investor, the, you know, the lower the price, generally speaking, the, the more favorable, um, in terms of investment opportunity and the, the reverse is true, certainly for, uh, sellers or, or founders, uh, raising capital, but, um, your question around kind of dilutive, non-dilutive capital, look, I would say, it, there are a lot of times we we take a look at companies that come to us that have have raised you know sometimes you know in orders of tens to twenty you know twenties of millions of dollars in, in non dilutive funding and and that's great but at the end of the day you're not going to be valued off of um, dollars coming in your organization from an NIH grant um, you're going to be valued off true kind of commercial revenues and building a, a sustainable business so. I think it's it's helpful to to have non dilutive sources of funding. I mean, I think it's certainly a great way to get started. It's a lot of way a lot of companies in the tool space uh, get off the ground. Um, but you know, I think as you start to to build a real business, you need to think about um, you really need to think about prioritizing commercial uh, revenues and and not you know focusing so much of your time and effort and the organization's effort around grants. Um, I think it, some of the other things to, to talk about, it looks like if not profitable, you should always be fundraising before you need it. That's a point um, I made, I guess, when I put these together with you, Matt, a couple couple weeks ago. But um, this is certainly a true statement. And, and quite frankly, if you are profitable too, you should probably always be fundraising before you need it because, um, you know, let's use the, the COVID environment we were in uh, as a good example. There were a lot of companies that, you know, hit a gold mine with COVID and then, you know, COVID wore off and the company is no longer prof profitable. And, um, you know, those guys are out, uh, are out looking to raise some capital and sometimes, you know, too late. So I think it's always good as, you know, if you're a CEO, uh, or CFO on the line, I think you should absolutely, uh, be interacting with the investment community, um, you know, at all times, even if there isn't a need and, um, and it looks like another bullet point on here. So one of the things in our markets that's become, uh, I'd say, pretty uh, a, a pretty new advent over the last, call it five to seven years, is there's a growing market of capital that's, that's coming from the large strategics in our, in our markets. Uh, the Danaher's, the Agilents of the world. Um, these guys are starting to invest um, in, uh, in venture stage companies. This isn't, you know, just... Uh, kind of traditional corp, de corp development activity where they're they're looking for kind of a change of control or M&A situation. But 
Um, those are groups certainly to start considering more and more. And I think, uh, you know, if they have or see strategic value in the product or service that you're developing, they're, uh, um, they can be helpful partners, but at the, at the same time, you got to be really careful uh, with those guys uh, because, you know, a lot of times there, there will be strings attached. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, and then I think Matt, your last question was around raising equity capital in an investor friendly market. Um, yes. Yeah. Some of the, the bullet points here, I mean, be judicious with your spending. Again, you, you probably already heard me harp on about, um, capital efficiency, but I think, you know, today it's, it's absolutely, you know, you need to be more prudent, um, because money is expensive right now. And it's, uh, in my opinion, that's not going to change for, for some time. So, I mean, you really need to be focused on capital efficiency. If you have a burn rate, reducing it, um, have a defined plan and outlook for six and 12 months. I mean, again, I can't emphasize enough that having a plan uh, is developing a plan, having a plan, trying to stick to it, revisit it um, every six to 12 months is extremely important. If you don't have a budget, you should. Um, if you don't have a plan, you should. Um, so some of that can stem from also having a, a good kind of experience board. And, you know, if you, you have a board now and your board's not helping you do that, then you should probably start looking for new board members. Um, being open to bridge rounds or other sources of financing. I mean, again, as I mentioned right now, it's, it's a tough time in our market to be raising equity. It's, it's going to be expensive. Um, you're going to have to be realistic about valuation. Their company multiples aren't around what they were and call it 2020 through 2021. Um, so if you're raising equity, you need to understand that it's not going to be cheap um, and a way maybe around that to, to try and, and bridge through to a, you know, what could be a better market. Um, I don't know. And some time is, is thinking about bridge rounds. Um, and again, you know, we're not in a time where big rounds and taking over the world is a, is a good idea, in my opinion. Um, depends on who you talk to. You know, if you go go down Sand Hill Road and Silicon Valley, they might still tell you differently. But I just I don't think that's a, a recipe for success. Got it. OK. Um, so kind of back into more of some of the nuts and bolts of the companies. Um, how did your clients prioritize market opportunity and applications? Did they, I think you addressed this previously, but did they take a more targeted or a broader approach? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a good, good question. I think some, you know, with, with some of our portfolio companies, it's, you know, sometimes it's happened haphazardly. They developed a, a product or offering for, you know, something they had in mind. And then, you know, it turns out they've got, um, you know, maybe it was a something that was meant for academic research, and then you know they they end up having pharma, you know, reaching out to them, and you know they realize there's a much bigger market in pharma than than they previously thought. But you know, I think once we get get involved, and um, you're talking about kind of allocating capital uh, that you might have on your balance sheet, I think it's uh, it's really important to understand um, the market opportunities that exist and and do really. Um, particularly if you have a, a product or technology that could be applicable for a lot of markets. Again, this, it's this idea of being, you know, capital efficient, um, but focus on, on the markets and or applications that are going to give you kind of the biggest bang for your buck. Um, okay. So there's a, you know, a bunch of different ways of doing that. Um, obviously there's consulting firms that specialize in doing that. Um, you know, LEK, um, uh, you know, a bunch of different folks who do it, but, you know, you can also do it on your own, right? You can you can make uh, some basic estimates on, you know, maybe it's a, a certain type of lab uh, that you're focused on that, you know, have a, a core lab offering single cell or flow um, that you're selling into. Um, you can start to figure out, you know, how competitive that market might be and start to force rank these things as you're, uh, you're starting to think about, you know, doing more product development into and to a certain end application. Um, so yeah, I, again, you know, 
I recommend a focused approach. Uh, I think, again, being very practical with resources and and focusing on a, a single niche and problem that that you can then build a realistic solution based on the capabilities you have in house is is the right way to do it. Okay. So you know, as you've um, you know identified these market opportunities and you know, the business begins to grow, um, you know, how, how does scaling impact the talent you hire? How do you hire with limited resources and, you know, leverage external resources? Yeah, no, this is, um, this is a, a great point. And, and quite frankly, I mean, hiring is, is so critical uh, for a growing business and, you know, it, it really, it can cause problems if you're making the wrong hires. And it can also, um, you know, can it can also lead to really kind of changing uh, the foundation or trajectory of a business if you get the right folks on ship. Um, again, I think, you know, as you're thinking about doing it with limited resources um, and trying to attract the best talent, I think you really need to be methodical about what the needs of the organization are, right? If you're trying to get to profitability and, and Let's say, you know, here's here's an example you've got. Um, you're trying to decide between building out a, you know, extending your R&D team to can you continue developing products um, or you're focused on, um, you know, adding to the commercial infrastructure you have at your business to to put you on a path to achieve profitability. Right. It's it's thinking about the market environment you're in and where you need to prioritize the needs of the business at that time. and and uh, what you gain and or lose by, by making the decision you made, you know, at least kind of just being methodical about, about where you're adding to the team and, and the needs of the organization. And look, sometimes you, you should be opportunistic too. I mean, you know, it's, uh, we're in a tough market right now where people, you know, heads are, heads are rolling left and right. And uh, quite frankly, that creates a lot of opportunity for a smaller company too. You might be able to land someone who would have never thought of, of joining, you know, an early stage business, um, but now they're on the market, and you know they. A lot of people were seeing with the mindset, "Hey, I already, I already got fired. Why not take an opportunity with an earlier stage company that has huge potential?" So, I think you need to be open about you know, open to to offering equity in, in the business for the right folks, and um, you know I think there's ways to be creative on comp. Um, for uh, for the right folks. Okay. So, and then when you've been, uh, I look. Oh, at- I sorry, sorry, Matt. One last point on that too. Sure. I think it's really important too. I mean, as you start achieving commercial traction, I, you know, we see a lot of companies deprioritize, at, quote unquote, some of the back office functions. If you can't afford a full time CFO, I really think it's important you bring in a a fractional executive who can help you maintain the books and, and, and help you again, kind of be more data driven, um, about where you're investing in your company based on, you know, financial decisions. So, you know, for some of our earlier stage entrepreneurs, I mean, that's something I always really encourage because having a good kind of finance financial partner in house can help you make a lot better decisions a lot more quickly, um, and a lot more rationally in, in the business sense. Okay, on that on that similar note, um, you know, what have you observed in leaders and employees who uh, transitioning from you know larger companies to the smaller high growth companies that you've been involved with? Yeah, uh, look, I think I think there's benefits to to folks. You know, there's certain uh, pros and cons to folks who have you know maybe spent the majority of their career in larger companies relative to those who have spent it in kind of smaller, more entrepreneurial environments. Um, in, in my experience, and again, this doesn't go for everyone, um, but what you tend to see, I think a lot of times with larger company operators who are coming to a, a smaller high growth business is those guys, they're used to having a lot of resources um, and they become, they're very good managers, which is extremely important to have in a, in a high growth business. Um, but you know, sometimes uh, there's a, a shock in realizing that, you know, they don't have 12 people across different functions to delegate, you know, work to. So, um, 
you know, I think if you're a smaller business and you're looking at making a hire, I, I always encourage people to not necessarily be wary of the large company operators, but just, just realize that, um, you know, there's, you really want to test whether or not that individual is willing to roll up their sleeves. Um, really, well, they have the mentality that, you know, they're not going to come in and say, oh, that's not my job. Um, at, you know, and then on the flip side, if you are a large company operator that's that's looking to transition into a smaller, you know, kind of high growth business or something you're excited or uh, about or deemed sexy, I think you really just have to understand that, you know, you're you're going to have to do things that maybe you traditionally, you know, would have considered below you. Um, it is very much the, the folks I've seen successfully do it are really open to rolling up their sleeves and uh, and helping, you know, wherever kind of is needed across across the organization. There's it looks like I made the point here, not much room for politics. Uh, that's absolutely true. I think, um, you know, the best executives I've seen that can lead high growth businesses. I mean, they're just they're laser focused on on growing the business and and you know there's just really not a tolerance for any kind of politics or um or anything that's kind of you know perverse to the culture they're trying to build so you got to be prepared to have all hands on deck um be a team player you know I make the point here this is probably obvious to everyone but respect is earned it's not granted through a title um Matt, I think you had a question about, you know, someone mentioned about working with a boss younger than you. I think, yeah. you know, it's it's probably, you know, something you're you're going to come across eventually. Um, so, you know, if it's something you're uncomfortable with, then, you know, maybe it's not for you. But at the end of the day, I, I think what really matters is performance. So I think if your boss is younger than you, but... Um, has a temperament that is lending itself to building a successful organization, um, then I, you know, I don't really see why it's a problem. I think you just got to swallow your ego. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, another individual asked, you know, what are your suggestions about how a founder should prepare for a board meeting? And maybe this, it's not a question that all the audience would, relate to, but maybe we can just cover that briefly if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, for sure. I, I think, you know, the first thing I would, I would recommend too, is you're thinking about maybe even kind of building out your board or folks that you're adding the board is, um, make sure you have people on there that you, you feel like can help you and provide guidance. I think a board meeting, uh, should be an opportunity for, uh, the executive team to, to come and, and get feedback. Um, but, you know, obviously when you've also, when you've taken other people's money, um, you know, and they're a shareholder in the business, you are um, a steward of their capital. So, you know, there's, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, making sure things are on track, but at the same time, you also want a board that is going to be helpful to you and, that you can be transparent with. So look, I would say if, if you've agreed to, you know, a certain budget and you've agreed to um, certain OKRs or, or goals for the year, I mean, be prepared to to know whether you're on track or not and be, be able to speak in detail to how you're trending. Uh, I think it's, you know, the, the thing I've seen with, with folks who aren't used to having kind of more of a formal board is, you know, they, they come in unprepared or, or not able to kind of defend, you know, where the business stands relative to what they agreed to and they get ripped apart. Um, at the same time, I, I think you should, you know, the way to kind of, I guess, break that dynamic, if you will, is, is really just be open about the challenges you're experiencing. I mean, look, at the end of the day, it's in my experience, most people don't achieve their numbers and, um, you know, and I think there's certain leniency around that at times, but I think you need to be open about the challenges you're having uh, and, and to share bad news transparently. Transparently, I think that goes a long way. I mean, um, 
you're really looking to kind of build a, a trusting relationship with your board members and and have them be you know willing to be consultative and understanding and 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 certain times particularly when when times are bad so uh that's important right um and then what else do we have on here um yeah make sure you're understanding what's going on in the market discuss headwinds and tailwinds in the business obviously you should have a board that can can have an idea of what those headwinds and tailwinds are and, and share the same um but uh and and also look you should have folks on there who who can be helpful to you i think you should be comfortable asking for advice or support when you need it uh that's what a, a good board does in my opinion on on top of just making sure you're not um you know driving the company into into a well right right okay well speaking of headwinds i guess um and leads to this next couple of slides if could you comment on the macro and micro view of the life science tools, services, and bioservices market? And, you know, there are headwinds, but what do you think is the long-term outlook? Yeah, look, I think at the end of the day, I mean, the market's going to go through cycles like it always does. And um, I, I think long-term, I mean, the trends remain positive. One of the things, you know, that could be said about healthcare is, you know, the spend the healthcare spend in, in the U.S. certainly is going to slow, slow down. I think the, the entire uh, uh, healthcare spend in the U.S. is larger than France's entire GDP and continues to continue to grow. But certainly, um, you know, in our niches, the life science tools, services and biopharma services market, I mean, innovation and um, and the spend on drug development. I mean, you know, it'll, it'll ebb and flow. But I think at the end of the day, there's going to probably a more rapid pace of innovation that's occurring that's going to lend itself to uh, to more spend going into drug development uh, and new therapies and, and thus, you know, disease research. Um, but, you know, at the same time, right, there's also kind of macro uh, economic uh, aspects that, that impact our market, right? Like the increasing interest rate environment we're in right now. But as I'm sure you know, most of the people on this call know, Fed's raising rates to moderate inflation, and that's had a direct impact on multiples uh, in our market and in every market. Uh, quite, quite frankly, uh, I mean, you, you've seen multiples decline um, directly as uh, as as rates have have been raised. So, cost of capital is certainly more expensive now, and that's that's going to impact prices. Um, as I just mentioned, there's declining public life science multiples. Um, in my opinion, I actually think the shift that we're seeing now is a return to sanity. I mean, it was 2020 through 21 didn't really make any sense to me. And, um, but it's, uh, I think we're, we're, we're certainly in a, a bear market, but it's, um, it's in my opinion, probably a, a healthy return. Um, and it's also really important to note, I mean, you know, we saw an ungodly amount of companies that that went public uh, in 2020 and 21 and had these, again, the big burn rate stories. But I think if you look at those same companies today, they've been absolutely punished. Um, you know, we have one company that's, you know, went public uh, during this time and um, they've had a very healthy growth rate. Uh, the business is, is well run, but. I mean, if you've got a burn rate, you're going to get punished, and they certainly have. Um, and then I'd, I'd be remiss to not mention, you know, what happened in the venture lending market. Uh, SVB was a huge part of our market, um, and you know, their collapse in in late March was uh, has kind of led to uh, venture lending being a bastardized name um, amongst banks. So it's kind of a double whammy for folks right now we're out raising equity capital because equity is way more expensive than it was and um you know venture lending is 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 not as prevalent as it was so you know it's much harder to raise capital yeah yeah well you've touched on this previously but you know maybe you could add any any additional comments about what you think about the impact of you know declining biotech funding and you know, the lingering impact of COVID. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so look, biotech funding is, 
since Q1 2022 has, has decreased dramatically. Um, the IPO market's virtually gone. Um, so it's it's gotten, I mean, again, when you think about kind of the end customer, um, you know, drug development, some of these budding biotech companies that are buying pharma services and, and, uh, and research tools, I mean, they've, they've, they've suffered a lot uh, from this. So I think, um, in my opinion, in the long term, I mean, VC, VC biotech financing growth had, had been greater than 20%, um, you know, call it over the last seven to 10 years. So that's going to continue to, to have positive stimulation in the longer term, but it's still, um, you know, we have to note that we're, we're not in, in times even like 2022, uh, early, early 2022. Uh, and then COVID obviously, you know, it's had a, a serious impact. I think in the longer term is, is really positive for our markets, um, for the reasons noted on the slide, but, um, you know, it obviously, I'm sure most of you dealt with supply chain management issues, staffing issues, uh, this kind of, you know, new hybrid work environment, um, and of course, in, inflation. So. Well, you did comment on what's happening to some of these top customers for life science tools and pharma services. Is there any additional comments you'd like to make about them regarding short term and long term views? Uh, sorry, say say that one more time. So you'd mention, you know, what's happening to some of the top customers for life science tools and pharma services, and those companies being the biotech and pharma pharma companies who are those customers. What are your thoughts regarding their the short term and long term view of those customers? Yeah, so you know, in the short term, I mean, we're we're certainly seeing across the portfolio. I mean, you know. The guys that are that are selling into uh, pharma, I mean, it, you know, the earlier stage R and D spend is being reallocated to to pharma's kind of top programs. So I think that's across the board for you know the the quote unquote budding biotechs, and also for um, you know the the Abbey's, Pfizer's of the world. Um, but you know, I think if if you are selling into pharma, I mean, certainly the the large blue chips are are more stable um and then you know they're obviously focused on on more their clinical stage programs now that's not to say i mean there there are companies that you know we're invested in where um some of the earlier stage r d programs are still flourishing it's um it's highly dependent on a lot of things i think um and quite frankly we're still dissecting it uh but but generally speaking that's that's been the trend um and then of, of course you know the COVID spike projects uh, that's starting to roll off. I mean, COVID's, you know, not surprisingly here to stay, but, um, you know, I think the, uh, the gold rush, if you will, is, uh, is dialing back. Um, longer term, I think, look, as I mentioned earlier, there's, uh, there's been a long-term trend of investment into new therapeutic development. And, you know, as I think anyone who's in the space knows, I mean, we're certainly, in, in my opinion, in a new era of, of therapeutic development and, and uh, technology development uh, with respect to biotech. Um, so I think we're going to continue to to really see a long term positive trend for for the space that, that we're all very excited about. And then, you know, I noted uh, uh, the former FDA commissioner's quote here. I I don't know if it'll be, a, you know, approving 10 to 25 CGT products a year, but, um, you know, it's certainly uh, going to be, in my opinion, more as we, as we move forward. So, uh, I think it's an exciting time to be in the space and, um, you know, long-term, I, I, I think this is just probably another typical market cycle. So. Okay. So we're kind of, we're run, running short on time. I'm just going to run, you know, this last one is, you know, what about the other customers like NH NIH funded projects and academia as customers to the life science tools and services? Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that. Yeah, NIH and academia, you know, I think um, probably arguably a more stable uh, market right now than, than pharma. Um, but, you know, I think uh, the NIH spent, it looks like in 2015, 30 billion and um, 2024, they're budgeting that 15 billion can't be right. It's probably a typo on my end. Um, 
50, it's probably closer to 51 billion um, is expected to be budgeted for 2024. Um, and look, we, you know, we're seeing academic research spend is, is healthy. It's, it's dialed back a bit, but you know, it's not falling off a cliff uh, for the most part. Um, and again, you know, I think longer term, the, the fundamental drivers demand or have historically been less sensitive to economic cycles in our markets, which, you know, long term, the whole thesis, I think, of Broad Oak is this is a great space to invest in because of that dynamic specifically. So um, sure, there's, you know, there's going to be market cycles along the way. That's no different from any industry. But um, longer term, I think it's an area that's really exciting to be in. All right. Um, I know we have uh, other questions that were added from the audience uh, previously, but there is one question in the chat box that um, I don't know if you saw that. Aaron, what's your view of a product company having a service business in terms of exit valuations? Yeah, yeah. sure. No, it, it's a great question. And um, Dan, it is. it looks like that's from Dan Calvo, who's uh, – a, an amazing CEO in our portfolio, uh, Sequel. Um, so really glad you could join Dan. Um, my view on a product company having a service business in terms of exit valuations is, as Dan could probably speak to, first of all, you know that model, uh, the the hybrid model when you're developing a, a a suite of products around a technology. I mean, sometimes you need a, a services business to help enable market adoption. I think. Uh, Nanostring is probably a really good example of that. I think their success was inextricably tied to, to creating market adoption through their service portfolio. Um, but nonetheless, Dan's question is around what's my view of, of a product company having a service business in terms of uh, multiples. I think I would say overall, I think if, if your revenues, if your business is tied to something proprietary, whether it be a service or product, uh, offering, then I think you're going to get a premium multiple on it. Now, you know, the folks who spend a lot of time in this space, you know, like, like Broad Oak does and Dan does, I mean, you know, there's, there are certainly services business businesses in this space that, you know, tend to trade on EBITDA multiples. And, and then you've got product companies that, um, you know, like instrumentation or, or uh, high margin reagents, like Dan's businesses that tend to trade on, uh, revenue multiples. So um, it kind of depends on how well of an exit process you run. And, um, you know, if you hire a banker, are they able to to uh, to create a competitive process that can justify a, a good exit? Um, but, you know, my inclination would be to 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 mark up uh, a service multiple on on the service side of the business that you know, is tied to tech-based revenues, and then, um, and then for the products business to give you a, a revenue multiple. Got it. Okay. Well, unfortunately, our time is running out. Um, was there any other questions or topics, Aaron, that you would like to cover? That um, you know, I had provided you some of the additional questions from the audience that you would like to comment on. We, I know our time is quite limited right now. Yeah, sure. I think there was a, a, a question about gene versus protein versus multiomics and uh, something about trends towards merging of technologies, specialization. I think it's a great yeah. question. I think uh, there is a, a mixed answer here and some of it depends on what part of the industry you're in, uh, tools versus services uh, and who your end markets are, pharma versus academic. I think you can be successful being really good at one thing. I mean, we we find a great um, we find a, a ton of great businesses that have really built a very focused offering in a in a niche space. And actually, that's one of the things I love about kind of the complications in this market. Sometimes it requires serious focus and, and technical expertise to uh, deliver even a very kind of focused offering. Um, so I would say focusing in molecular or pro proteomics or whatever analyte it is you have poor capabilities in um, is, isn't a bad thing. But there is most certainly growing demand for multiomic offerings. Uh, I think that is uh, multiomic might be kind of the word of the last two or three years now. Um, but, I, you know, I'd, I'd highlight an example would be what's happening in the single cell instrumentation market, which 
is still obviously dominated by 10x, but the original instrumentation was focused on RNA as an analyte. But, um, you know, we started to obviously see researchers express interest in other analytes. Um, and since, you know, you've seen Mission Bio launch this instrumentation that can analyze DNA and cell surface proteins and single cells simultaneously. Uh, similarly, 10X at BD and Biorad have, have all since launched offerings to analyze gene expression and, and cell surface proteins simultaneously as well in single cells. So, um, you know, another example of this, would, one of my company's flagship bio uh, is a spatial biology CRO, a really, really impressive uh, management team that um, has come together there to continue to, to build um, what is what is becoming a fantastic company. But they built their flagship offering, no pun intended, in, uh, in digital pathology. Um, but most of our, our clients uh, have become interested in obviously what's going on at the molecular level of their programs as well. So we acquired a lab that offered a, uh, a larger suite of molecular capabilities as well as flow um, to, to really deliver a quote unquote multiomic picture uh, for the clients that I think is unique. Um, long story short, I think there's a multiomic trend occurring, but uh, you can still build a great business specializing. Great, great. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. I, I think there's still a lot more to cover, but unfortunately our time has run out. I uh, really appreciate you joining us and for participating in our webinar. Um, and a link to the webinar recording will be sent to the participants, so that will be coming. Um, we hope to see you at our next series where I'll be hosting Charlie Silver, former founder and CEO of Mission Bio, on August 23rd, where, I'll, where he'll share some of his lessons learned uh, while leading high growth companies. Aaron, thanks so much. Thank everyone, you, yep, everyone have a great week. Take care.